Uh, well, thanks a lot, Jing, um, for the uh, warm welcome and the kind introduction. And then thanks to the uh, committee for inviting me uh, this morning. So I hope everyone's uh, wide awake. I know it's early, but uh, I'll do my best to, you know, keep things moving. And uh, yeah. All right. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today and uh, share a story about how we try to learn um, the origin of small scale fracture in bone. And we're going to try to link that to some of the metal additive manufacturing work and maybe pose some questions, um, you know, that really describe the directions that my group will be going here at Penn. So let me start uh, with something that maybe some of you are familiar with. I know the crowd here is a little bit younger, um, but what I'm showing here on the bottom left uh, is a fairly healthy hip. So, um, you know, you have your... <clears throat> head of the femur, uh, you have uh, generally what enables you to walk around campus, uh, play with your kids, you know, play sports, run, um, very healthy cartilage. Now on the right side, you have a condition known as osteoarthritis, where you have critical degradation of that cartilage, and it often affects the bone as well. Uh, and this is hugely problematic and expensive for individual people. Now, since the 1960s, the way we've really been uh, solving this problem from a surgical and clinical point of view is something known as the total hip arthroplasty, which is effectively uh, a complete replacement of this joint. So uh, it might sound a little bit barbaric without context, but basically what happens is a surgeon comes in and lops off the head uh, of that femur and replaces it with uh, what has typically been you know, some titanium alloy. Um, and we're effectively replacing uh, that whole joint as well. So you have a titanium alloy and oftentimes at least some of the better uh, uh, processes for these are, are um, alloy on polymer contact. Um, now this works, you know, you know, it's a little bit unfortunate, but this is actually one of our best sort of orthopedic surgical processes. However, it comes with a number of problems. Right, so you can have a uh, fracture of the native bone after this procedure, you can have dislocation of the joint and loosening of the implant. And this will result in you know, additional necessary surgeries. And you can imagine that this is painful and expensive for patients. So this is what I mean by uh, you know, a multi-scale biocompatibility mechanical problem. Um, now, this is one example, but when you look at the body from head to toe, we're really inundated with a number of biocompatibility problems. So what I'm showing on the top here, sorry, let me move. There we go. So what I'm showing on the top here uh, are neural implants that are developed by uh, Neuralink uh, to probe deeper and deeper into the brain. However, these uh, probes are silicon nitride, which are intensely stiff relative to, bone, uh, to, to brain tissue. Uh, and the limitation of that is, you know, the deeper you go, the more likely you are to bend and break these silicon nitride probes, right? And the deeper you can probe, the better, the more parts of the brain you can probe, the better you can understand what's happening. Uh, so that's currently a limitation. So we can go a little bit uh, further down uh, and look at things like rotator cuff surgeries um, where these sutures that are often used tend to serve as stress concentrations and that can lead to additional tears. And that's sort of a huge problem. There's been some beautiful work developed by Guy Janin, sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't know why this is auto playing. Give me one second. Oh, there we go. So there's been some beautiful work uh, developed by Guy Janin um, at WashU St. Louis, where he's got these sort of bear claw like structures that help distribute stress uh, when they're doing their reattachment. So it's, you know, there are some, some nice uh, efforts out there. And then of course, there's this uh, total hip arthroplasty that I described to you earlier. And we tend to think of these problems really in terms of the, the, uh, the elastic properties of the tissues, right? Tissue elastic modulus in the body where it really ranges from, from KPAs down to, to GPA or up to GPAs in the, in the case of bone. Um, so, you know, before I move on, you know, let me present to you what is sort of an ideal vision, right? For, um, you know, this sort of uh, therapeutic replacement, right? So ideally, a, a perfect implant is something that is mechanically compatible, biocompatible, uh, and regenerative. And what I mean by that is sort of what this, this video is showing is that something that you can uh, introduce to the body, something that enables mobility of the patient, 
uh, enables regeneration of the native tissue and allows it to redeem its original uh, structural properties. So this is quite difficult. And the reason we have trouble doing this is because of this statement up here. Uh, biogenic materials, so in other words, materials that are uh, formed and created by cells, um, so in this case, specific tissues, are uniquely light, tough, strong, and tunable. So they, they possess all of these properties, and this is um, quite tricky. So let me explain to you what I mean by that, uh, by populating this Ashby plot, so this materials properties uh, plot of specific uh, strength versus specific toughness. So I, I think the community uh, has a fairly good mechanics background, but let me show you a sort of a simplified uh, discussion or example of what I mean by specific strength or specific toughness. So in, you know, typically in terms of strength, what we are really describing is a material's uh, resistance to inelastic or permanent deformation. Uh, so in a stress strain plot, it tends to be this point, you can define it in many different ways. Um, and in terms of toughness, we can think about this in a couple of ways. One is sort of a more intuitively easy to understand definition, which is you know, the energy it takes to effectively uh, fracture uh, material um, highlighted here. Or you know, we can think of it really more in the strength intensity uh, form, which is the material's resistance really to uh, propagating a crack in the presence of an existing flaw. Um, characterized here by some dimension A. So we'll keep that simple uh, so I can continue to populate this plot. So in this plot, a material that has these properties that is light, strong, and tough should populate an area in this upper right uh, corner here. So this is really the ideal space. So let me introduce natural materials. And this is quite nice, right? They tend to populate this upper right area. They're light, strong, tough, and tunable uh, in this red box. But when we start to populate this, plot with uh, our sort of toolbox of engineering materials, uh, including ceramics, polymers, metals, and even engineering composites, you can see that there's actually something um, really to be desired here, right? Um, we, we can't quite reach the upper regions that we can with natural materials. And keep in mind, this is a log-log plot, right? Um, so for me, that raises a couple key fundamental questions. Uh, so how do biogenic materials achieve this really wonderful combination of strength and toughness? Um, and once we start to understand that, how do we leverage that, uh, you know, in terms of developing uh, some great synthetic materials? And it sounds like, you know, that's the kind of work that a lot of people in the audience are doing. Um, so let me take a step back and, and sort of present sort of a more uh, general vision for the type of work that my lab is doing for us, the, the real fundamental basis and platform is in situ small scale tissue mechanical experiments where we can sort of control the environment. We can really observe uh, what's happening in terms of microstructure under different loading conditions. Uh, from that, you know, of course, we wanna be extracting constitutive models, even phenomenological models in terms of tissue response uh, to certain stimuli. And all that information should really, you know, ideally uh, organically go into how we process and synthesize materials in terms of biocompatibility. Um, so to kind of get the story moving here, let me focus on uh, something we've done in terms of developing uh, small scale tissue mechanical experiments. And I'm gonna do that by posing the following question. Um, so here I'm asking you what happened when uh, my colleague um, in grad school fractured his arm and in reality, the, the, I think the scientific question is how does toughness originate from the structure of bone? And we're gonna focus on bone in this talk um, because in, in sense it, it relates to, to the problem I posed at the very beginning, um, but it's actually quite interesting in terms of the hierarchy that it possesses over a variety of length scales. So I'm gonna show you here uh, schematically from the large length scale down to the nano scale, what we understand about uh, the mechanisms of fracture in bone. So at large length scales, when you're breaking a bone and when a crack is propagating through a bone, it interacts with these 200 micron or so uh, obstacles known as osteons, these fairly, uh, and, and has cement lines, these stiff interfaces. And when the crack 
hits one of these, it deflects, and of course, crack deflection really removes uh, energy away from that primary crack and um, prevents, it can prevent catastrophic failure. Now we can look at a smaller length scale uh, where we have this mechanism known as uh, ligament bridging, but what's really occurring is you'll have these secondary cracks opening up in front of a primary crack. And of course, the, the formation of these new surfaces is another mechanism of energy dissipation that can, again, prevent your primary crack from causing catastrophic failure. And then lastly, for the moment, um, you can think about this idea of diffuse microcracking at the smaller lane scales where uh, this sort of damage, um, of course, uh, has an energy penalty, which again is pre preventing your primary crack from uh, causing catastrophic failure. So this at this stage is effectively a nice uh, microstructural and qualitative picture of what we used to really understand about uh, bone fracture. Let me put it in a slightly uh, quantitative way for you. Um, so what I'm plotting here, uh, it's effectively an R curve. So we're, but in a log lock plot, and I'm doing this to illustrate a specific point. So we're plotting, uh, this K sub J, which is sort of a stress intensity factor really that calculated from, uh, J, but we're plotting it as a function of crack extension. So we're looking at basically in a way, the energy that it takes to continue to propagate a crack in a material as a function of that of crack extension. Uh, so what I'm plotting here first is some work done by Rob Ritchie, uh, where they really investigated at the macro scale, um, the fracture toughness of bone. And they were able to observe that this mechanism of crack deflection really dominates at large length scales. Uh, and what we've done is we've plotted their data and then we've fitted it to a phenomenological um, uh, a scaling exponent, which I'll show in a minute, um, but here it's 0.94. So this shouldn't mean a whole lot to you right now. So I'm gonna give you some proper context for it. So one of these other really interesting biomaterials uh, or biogenic materials uh, is knacker. So in this case is a brick and mortar structure and you can describe a crack effectively as the pulling and opening of this brick and mortar structure. So this is some really great work uh, done, I think when he was at McGill, no, uh, this is some done, great work done by Horacio uh, Espinosa um, and Francois Bartola. Um, but we, we, we plot and we fit a 0.22 exponent, right? And then lastly, we have a structure or material that has effectively no hierarchical structure. So this is a metallic glass and work done by Bill, uh, Bill Johnson um, at Caltech. So metallic glass is effectively compared to these two materials have no levels of hierarchy, right? Uh, this is a disordered material. And we fit a smaller scale exponent, 0.17. And this is, this is effectively uh, what we're looking at here, effectively. How does that toughness scale with, um, uh, how does K scale with, with crack extension? And we can see that, you know, with increasing system of hierarchy, we're phenomenologically observing a higher scaling exponent. So this is kind of, poses a certain number of questions. Um, you know, with something that has this many levels of hierarchy, how does that toughness originate at these smaller length scales, right? There's actually more microstructure that is not really resolved in these large length scales that, that is down here. Um, so to look at that, let me go back to this uh, microstructural picture and pose a couple of interesting uh, things or mechanisms that I've been hypothesized, but weren't really experimentally observed and quantified. So at a sort of nano length scale, you have these mineralized collagen fibrils in bone uh, that are you know, about hundred nanometers um, that are really hypothesized to bridge, uh, you know, uh, initiating cracks and prevent them from opening. Uh, and another thing that occurs, or at least is hypothesized to occur, is the sliding of these fibrils and even the uncoiling of individual uh, collagen um, fibers. So you can imagine that understanding and isolating these mechanisms, or at least being able to observe them, is quite critical to understanding how, uh, at least to answering this question effectively, or how does toughness originate from the structure of bone? Uh, and the way we approach that, 
excuse me, is by developing uh, an experiment, which is, I think, fairly well understood at the macro scale, but really shrinking it and, and doing it in a site specific manner uh, in bone, which is effectively um, <clears throat> looking at fracture uh, in orientation specific uh, bone samples at smaller length scales. So <clears throat> let me show how this is done. So let's take this uh, piece of uh, this femur down to the, 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 the condyle. If you look at the cross, so this is basically the knee joint, um, the upper portion. If you go to the cross section of the knee joint, you get this trabecular structure. So this was the, the title slide in a sense uh, of beams and plates. You look at one of these uh, beams or plates and you look at the cross section of it, you have this lamella structure, these five micron lamella bundles. And then you take one of these bundles um, using TM lift out. You can uh, site specifically pull out uh, a piece of bone in a really you know, well constructed uh, geometry and get this freestanding lamella beam. So this is a beam of bone that's about uh, 40 uh, microns in span. Um, we can introduce a notch here using the focused ion beam. This is, this is done in an SCM. We can apply a load using a diamond wedge tip and the uh, support substrate here is um, uh, fabricated in silicon. So using very classical uh, micro nanofabrication techniques. And then if we really want to know what's, what sort of structure we're looking at, you, know, you can take the sample, you can thin it down, uh, down to hundred nanometers and look at it in TM and you can really look at the orientation of collagen in the specimen that you're, um, uh, that you're going to test. So, you know, here are a couple of videos or GIFs uh, describing the process of how we do this. Um, so this is the beam being set up on some silicon substrates. And then this is a general description of the process. And we, so we've done this in silicon, um, not just bone, we've looked at it in metallic glasses. So it's fairly uh, generalizable um, and applicable to other materials. Um, okay, so, like I said, I know it's the morning and I know Zoom seminars can be, uh, you know, it's easy to drift off. So I'm gonna take a second here to um, maybe engage the grad students in the audience and, and have them, uh, you know, hypothesize and maybe put it in the chat if you wish. So what I'm gonna set up now are two experiments. Um, one in which we have, again, imposed an artificial a notch using the focused on beam and the lines here are indicating the orientation of um, the collagen fibrils. And then what we've done with the other set of specimens uh, is we've applied an oscillating load in order to induce a fatigue pre-crack. So this is sort of the ideal situation, right? Because we're, we're really interested in um, the resistance to a pre-existing uh, physiologically formed crack, um, right? So as close to atomically sharp as possible. Um, so, you know, put it in the chat, hypothesize, which one do you think, uh, at least we will measure a higher fracture toughness for? Okay, so let's start with the artificially notched uh, experiment. So what we're plotting here is K, um, the stress density, which is in this particular geometry linearly related to uh, the load that's being applied. And then on the bottom, we're just plotting the uh, load line displacement, so the displacement um, being imposed by the diamond wedge tip. So. What I want you to focus on in both videos is gonna be the notch uh, tip. We're gonna see a crack emanating. So of course, linear elastic behavior, and then you see slow, stable crack growth uh, there, and then bam, some catastrophic failure. Uh, and as this plays again, uh, I'm gonna put a K1C value down of about 0.54. So for context, uh, you know, silicon, I think in the 110 direction uh, measures a little bit under one. Uh, that's it. One, uh, so, so this is dry, brittle bone, right? So 0.54. All right, so let's put up the realistically fatigued pre crack experiment. And, and for this one, we uh, went slightly higher in mag so you can really see what's going on. So you'll see first in the linear elastic region, the crack is actually just opening rather than the pre-crack is opening. So it's not growing a new crack. So we're just opening the pre-crack here. And then we start to see new crack growth. And then we get that catastrophic failure. 
and we measure uh, one, about one MPA root meter. Um, so I don't know how your, your guesses were or your hypotheses were, but uh, it's, I, I posed that intentionally because it was a little bit counterintuitive what happens. Um, but yeah, fatigue pre-crack samples are measuring a higher uh, crack initiation toughness, so higher K1C. So what, why is that? So there's something kind of interesting about the structure that we're looking at here. And that's basically, so as I play this video, I'm gonna show you a couple of things. One is, you know, we can measure the crack opening uh, displacement, um, but this is one of these fatigue pre-crack samples. And what's interesting is that in the crack wake, you know, be, before the new crack is opening, right, in the fatigue pre-crack, um, the matrix of the bone is what's cracking, but the fibers seem to remain intact. So we have an existing crack that actually has intact fibers that are bridging uh, basically the, the, the crack surfaces together. And this is why we think we're, we're measuring a higher K1C. Um, and let me, let me push this point even further, right? This sort of crack bridging idea a little bit further by looking at the post-mortem images of this. So, if you take the sample, you look at it afterwards, uh, on one side, you can see these dangling uh, collagen fibrils here on the order of uh, 50 nanometers. And on the other side, you can see holes that have pulled out, uh, have left again on your order of 50 nanometers. So this is quite interesting. So we're observing directly that uh, mechanism that we described. Um, but fiber bridging has a number of steps, uh, you know, and it'd be interesting to know exactly which one is contributing most to the energy uh, that's preventing, you know, further crack opening. So I'm just showing two, I think, of the more important ones here, which is uh, frictional debonding. So basically, the debonding of the, sorry, yeah, of the fibers from the matrix, uh, and then uh, the actual post pullout process where the fibers are pulling out. So this is very much analogous to the work that's been done on uh, fiber reinforced composites. So of course, you know, I'll pull uh, some of the models from uh, Hutchinson uh, and Jensen in the 90s, where really what's impor important here um, are the tensile strength of the fibers in relation to the, shear, the interfacial shear strength, right, between the fibers and the matrix. Uh, and they, these can be used to describe the change in energy that you would expect from debonding as well as the change in energy that you would expect from pullout. So because we can measure crack opening displacements and we know, you know, we can measure effectively everything uh, during this process, we can look at uh, the experimental delta J that we're seeing uh, and then plot sort of the spaces that should be occupied by uh, pullout and by debonding. So one thing is very clear initially is that frictional debonding alone can't describe what's happening in the process. And then when you start to include pullout, you can see that a lot of our data as a function of crack opening starts to fill into this pullout regime. Not only that, if you start to fit the data, uh, you know, by guessing certain values of ratio of uh, shear strength to, or I should say, tensile strength is your strength, you can actually start to understand maybe the variation, uh, the spatial variation um, in these two properties in both, right, at the small length scale. So this is likely where the scatter in our data is coming from is that in some areas that uh, the adhesion or the, yeah, the adhesion between the, the fibers and the matrix is different and in some regions, the fibers are probably um, a stronger in tension. And that's not unexpected, right? Like you, you, there should be some distribution. Um, specifically in the material like that. So, you know, we went sort of deep into the mechanism. Let me pull back, right, as to how we set this set up this experiment, which was this picture, um, where we were really asking, you know, something with this much hierarchy, uh, what is happening at the length scale? And so what I can do at the small length scale, so what I can do now is, is bring that data in. And what we observe is that, yes, uh, large length scale of crack deflection is really causing most of the, the arc of behavior. However, when you isolate bone and you remove by the specimens that we work with, this mechanism is not accessible, right? Because it's much, it's a much smaller length scale. 
And what we see is that we enable the ability to measure what's happening at these small lens scales by isolating the microstructure. And it's quite nice because we observe a totally different uh, scaling behavior uh, on the scale of 0.14. So now we have something that has, you know, really one, two levels of hierarchy, you know, sort of similar to what's happening here. And we're observing a phenomenological scaling exponent that's closer to that. Um, so that's quite nice in the work, but I think the point that I'm trying to make, I think on a larger um, scale and in general is that because this happens, because the properties change as a function of plane scale, we absolutely have to account for scale dependent tissue properties when it comes to how we think about therapeutics, how we think about understanding uh, tissue mechanics in general, because this is the lane scale at which cells interact with the tissues. Okay. So, you know, taking that last statement, right, this is the length scale which cells interact with the tissues. Um, you know, we've been talking mostly about toughness, but let me take a quick moment uh, to describe some of the work we've done uh, in terms of just uniaxial uh, tension and compression in bone. So to provide a little context, uh, this is really just describing what's happened uh, under uniaxial deformation, some, some literature context. Uh, and bone. So if you, there's some really great work done by Hamadri Gupta. Um, so what they have observed is in just pulling uh, bone at the macro scale, you can see it behaves elastically and then there's some post uh hardening, so to speak. Uh, some great work by then, uh, Lorna Gibson. You know, the trabecular structure basically behaves, behaves like a stochastic foam. Uh, and then, if you start to look at that lamella structure that I described before. So if you notice something here, you have this striated architecture, right? When this is where you can observe the lamella. So if you uh, do pillar compression, so if you can isolate these lamella and compress them, uh, um, uniaxially, you'll, you'll get this nice behavior. It's some great work done in 2014, uh, linear elastic and then some hardening. Uh, however, you know, let me show you quickly what this structure looks like. So you get, so this is uh, TEM. Uh, of the lamella structure in bone. So you get this sort of banding pattern that you can see from the left to right. And then these uh, dark lines uh, from the top left to the bottom right. That's those are the minerals. And then the banding patterns are, show the characteristic uh, collagen 67 nanometer alignment. So it's everything is nice and ordered um, structured. However, if you remove the, the collagen, you can even see some really nice, uh, you know, uh, planes of the hydroxy appetite there. So if you look where there's a missing um, lamella structure, you, you actually see something quite different. This is something that we, we observed uh, in this work is that the minerals are bent. Uh, we don't see a nice ordered arrangement of the, the collagen structure. And then when you remove the, the, the collagen, you see there's actually presence of uh, disordered mineral. Um, and the point of this is that, you know, within, you know, this small spatial movement of, of uh, maybe 50 microns, you, you see totally different uh, structure from order to disorder. And some of the things we've been able to do is actually do compression uh, at these smaller length scales. Um, so these are actually pillar diameters. And we observe that, you know, as you go from relatively large, which is the lamella structure, three microns, you transition from this um, sort of uh, elastic, perfectly plastic behavior, really call it, should call it an elastic here, uh, to really brittle structure when you get to the length scales of just the mineralized collagen fibrils. And again, in, the, in this vacuum uh, context. So let me take a step to uh, summarize sort of the bone region here. Um, so the way I pose this is that you know, these biogenic materials have this really untapped uh, combination of strength and toughness. And the reason for that is there's just incredible uh, wealth of mechanisms that, uh, you know, enable different forms of deformation and prevent catastrophic failure. And that really stems from, again, this, this incredible um, a number of hierarchy layers. And we've been able to show that very quantitatively, you know, and experimentally in, in bone in terms of its toughness by looking at seeing a transition 
and behavior, and then as well in terms of its uniaxial uh, deformation behavior, right? So, that kind of brings us to, well, what about, uh, you know, what can we do in terms of repair? Uh, so for those of you who are a little bit squeamish when it comes to, to blood, uh, the next slide, you know, is a little bit uh, gruesome, but we're gonna talk a bit more about, you know, producing materials that are compatible. So this is some really great work done by Ramila Shaw, uh, where they were able to 3D print these hydroxyapatite uh, cranial plates. And after about four weeks, they're starting to see nice growth back into the structure, which is, is really nice, but it's not load bearing. Um, and you know we want to be able to produce structures that, that can be load bearing. And when you do that, you have to move to metallic implants, like I said earlier. So this is a nice group, uh, nice group in China that are produced these titanium implants uh, into a sheep, I believe, and they're able to see some, some great regrowth. Uh, some great osteointegration. Um, but the limitation here is that this will remain there um, and the tissue will never have its full functionality. So there's sort of this, this interesting uh, approach you, when you're thinking about um, alloys that can be tuned to the grade. Uh, so there's some great work, again, out of China um, by looking at zinc, magnesium, and copper uh, alloys uh, that you know, show regrowth and have tunable degradation uh, in the body, which is quite nice. The limitation here with these alloys is that this work is not yet uh, patient specific. So you can't 3D print the structure to work for a specific patient. Um, and this I think is where uh, there's some really nice uh, opportunities for metal 3D printing in terms of orthopedics. So uh, metal 3D printing is a fairly emerging technology. There are many ways to do it. I think one of the more popular ones is uh, laser powder bed fusion, which is a fairly complicated uh, thermal physical process. But effectively, you have a bed of metal powders yeah, and you raster with a laser layer by layer in order to build uh, you know, a structure layer by layer. So it's, in a, in a sense, uh, powder stereolithography. So one of the issues with you know trying to print the structure is that copper here is actually fairly difficult to print. Um, but you know, provide a little bit more context from metal OEM, it's it's a fairly nice emerging technology as I described, you know, in a sense that it can be great for uh, healthcare applications, but you know, it goes beyond that to automotive, aerospace, and even uh, just the consumer uh, industry. However, there's sort of a number of limitations, one of which is, you know, it's a complicated process that we don't fully understand how to control perfectly yet. And the other is that, you know, the library of like very easily and readily printed materials, so the sort of plug and play uh, materials, that's fairly limited, right? Um, so for example, with stainless steel, uh, the way this process works is, you know, you can really just input CAD. Uh, so this is uh, us printing this, uh, octet structure when I was at Stanford. Um, so what you're seeing here is the rebrushing of that layer and then the sparks are the melting uh, layer by layer. But like I said, copper is one of these uh, difficult to print um, materials and that's because what we're hitting the powders with is a 1070 nanometer laser at this wavelength, copper absorbs something like 3%. However, these other materials absorb up to uh, you know, 40%, 30 to 40% and higher. Uh, so it's a huge limitation there. And one of the things we've been working on is how can we modify copper, right? Which is a critical component of, of this uh, biocompatible and biodegradable uh, alloy uh, to become printable. And you know, beyond those applications, you can imagine that this is actually would be nice for thermal uh, management as well, right? When you can 3D print copper to whatever structure you want, uh, it really opens up um, a lot of opportunities in terms of thermal management for data centers, for example. So, um, you know, we've done some pretty nice things in terms of uh, printing copper using uh, nano texturing. Um, so this work is still ongoing, uh, but effectively we've uh, you know, when you print uh, on copper, sort of as purchased, you get these instabilities, these melt pool instabilities, uh, because there's no adhesion to the substrate and it's not absorbing enough energy. 
However, we've done some uh, really nice texturing work that shows that you know, we can improve the absorptivity of individual powders and we can start to produce these continuous, um, or at least more continuous uh, single layers. And this is when we first started, but now what we're doing is actually printing, um, I think in full. So this is an architect structure, again, back when I was at Stanford. And, oh, sorry. There we go. So what we have an architect structure with the Stanford logo on it. Um, so, you know, beyond texturing, we've done some really great uh, nanoparticle work as well. You know, we're thinking about, you know, how can you modify the powders with as little of, of an additive as possible? So we synthesized a number of, uh, or a couple of nanoparticles. And we did really nice calorimetry experiments that can show the benefits of adding, for example, graphene by a very small weight fraction. Um, so what we're doing here is we have nanoparticles on a uh, copper substrate. Uh, we're doing calorimetry by measuring the backside temperature. Uh, and we can see that over a variety of laser scanning conditions. So this is just showing power here. We can increase the absorptivity of the pure copper from, like I said, three to 10% here uh, up to you know, 50 to, to 40% uh, percent at high powers. And what's really nice is you can do this. So this is sort of just a setup showing the process, but if you introduce it in the powders, uh, you can do fully printed structures. So what I'm showing here are cross sections of printed cylinders. Uh, and we're looking at the relative density as a function of what we're calling energy density, which is really just um, a description of how much energy is going into the system. So the top here are these copper plus graphene system. And this is just a, as printed copper. And we can see that we can reach nearly full density in the copper plus graphene system. Um, and much higher density at lower uh, energy densities. So it's, it's quite nice um, and we're really excited about this work. So uh, I think I'm coming up on the time here. So I'm gonna you know, take a step back again and, and show this vision, all right? So like I said, um, for us, the, the really important thing is being able to understand uh, tissue mechanical properties of small length scales. And you know, we wanna move beyond uh, you know, the sort of quasi-static work that we were doing because, you know, in real life, your, your, your loading uh, schemes are dynamic, they're high strain rate. Um, so we're, we're, we're developing some nice uh, experiments to move in this direction and to really move into the hydrated uh, world as well, because it means that we can go um, into softer tissues, actually. Uh, so, and then beyond that, you know, really establishing the, um, the understanding at these small length scales for healthy tissues, we can start to move into disease and rege regenerating tissues at the length scale and start to work with clinicians and patients directly. Um, you know, there's a nice benefit to working at this scale. We don't need a whole lot of tissue to study something. And then of course, all this information start to really uh, tie nicely into our ability to control uh, structure and, and, and 3D print and plants directly. Um, so, I just want to take a moment and uh, thank some of the really great groups and, and uh, co-authors and collaborators that I work with. So, so of course, Julia Greer, Wei Tsai, uh, Adrian Liu, and, and uh, Evo Matthews at Livermore, of course, uh, Professor Wendy Gu at Stanford, Vikram Deshpande, Cambridge, uh, Lucas Mesa, uh, and of course, some our really great uh, funding um, and institutional resources. And uh, yeah, so thank you. And then uh, of course, take a moment to say that we're looking for a postdoc and uh, we are hiring PhD students. So I started uh, January 1st here at Penn. So uh, yeah, it'd be great to be to, to grow the team. Uh, yeah, so feel free to email me. All right, thanks. And um, yeah, take questions. I think I hit 45 minutes. Um, any questions from the audience? Uh, Jin, I think I, you have a question in the chat box. You can, you may ask right now. Yeah, so Altman, someone asked me, what's the smallest room in the world? I know it's a mushroom. And if someone asks me, what's the smallest three point of bending experiment? And I can say it's Altman's experiment. <laughs> Altman, it's, it's super cool for your experiments. It's quite a small land scale. So I have a question in the, so for the human being, lots of those bones or tissues, we have water or at least some water environment. So for your experiment, do you have some comment about the dehydration? 
And also for your final part for the uh, 3D printing, do you have some comment about the biocompatibility? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 great. Thanks, Jen. Um, so, like I said, uh, one of the you know limitations right now, at least with the 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 way we've done these experiments, is we're doing it in SEM. Um, so we are understanding uh, the dehydrated bone as is, um, but because we we can do it in the SEM and we can learn all these things, uh, and we can actually measure the compliance while the practice is going, we can actually move this setup. Uh, to be um, a bit more in vitro and do it ex situ. Um, mm -hmm. So that's actually one of the things we're developing here. So we don't have to do this while we're observing it because we can measure the compliance while the crack is going so we can get a lot of information um, that way. Uh, one of the downsides of the dehydrated work is of course, yes, the ability uh, of collagen to deform viscoelastically is really dependent on a hydrogen right. environment. So we're, we're missing that uh, critically here. So that, that'll absolutely change the toughness that we measure. So absolutely true. And then in terms of the metal AM and biocompatibility, so copper uh, itself has, I think it's a the approved, but limited compatibility. The, what we really wanna do is move towards um, alloying in situ while we're printing. So being able to control uh, how much copper we're introducing um, into let's say titanium, for example, or into a zinc, um, zinc based alloy. Uh, the problem with that right now is even if you were to add uh, copper into a zinc based printing process, because it doesn't absorb, it won't melt. So you'll end up with, you know, a zinc structure and then like copper powders interspersed with it rather than an alloy. So the, the, the ability to print copper by itself um, will enable the ability for us to alloy in situ. And then you can imagine that we can spatially control how we alloy, um, things like that, yeah. Thank you. Any questions from other audience? Um, Bobo, I saw you raised the hand. Uh, hi, yeah, you can, you can go ahead. Me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, hi. thank you. <clears throat> Uh, thank you for your very interesting and very fancy presentation, Professor Toby uh, Leno. I have two small questions. Uh, the first question is uh, uh, regarding your slide about uh, uh, slide 29. Mm, sure, I'll slide go, back and, go back and find that. Uh... Okay. Here, right? Uh, yeah, and uh, I actually maybe uh, the previous one with uh, uh, one pre uh, one notched uh, sample and one pre fatigue crack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. this one. Yeah, uh, I, I, my, uh, my question is that uh, how many samples have you performed for each of the uh, artificially notched and fatigue pre cracked uh, samples? Yeah, so in, in this for this paper, we did five of each. So you can imagine, uh, um, you know the sample prep is pretty arduous, right? So we're doing TM lift out for every single uh, sample. So the data we're showing is five of each. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And another question is that is a uh, regard about uh, slides, uh, slides uh, 59. 59. Yeah. Yeah, here uh, uh, on, on, the, on the figure, you show that uh, when you add some new materials uh, into the uh, CU, the, the, the copper, and uh, the energy absorbed is, uh, is increased a lot. I wonder uh, the increase of, the, of such kind of, uh, uh, such kind of increase of the energy, how can, uh, how does it help to melt the, the copper? Yeah, um, so I think, what might be useful is if I had the backup slides from uh, this paper. Uh, so we, yeah, we, we looked at this a couple of ways. I think we, we weren't able to nail it down exactly, um, but the peak temperature rises critically uh, when, you, when you can increase the objectivity, right? So these systems, we chose them because they have different 
melting points relative to that of copper. So copper is 1258K, uh, copper sulfide that we synthesized these nanoparticles, uh, 773K, the titanium diboride around 3500K, and then the graphene you know, a bit over 4,000 um, 4, Kelvin. Um, so what's nice is you get increased temperature on the surface of the copper. And then at around 800 uh, C, um, copper's absorptivity itself spikes. So you go from the 3% and then it starts to increase. Um, and then of course, it just enables you to get to uh, melting point quicker. And then the process is a lot harder to describe because you're looking at absorption into the melt pool uh, as well as into the nanoparticles. The other thing that can also happen is direct heat transfer from uh, the nanoparticles to the substrate. And we, we don't have a great way to describe that yet. Uh, the morphology of the particles changes too during the process, right? So we're hitting this with a, um, at least in the substrate based experiments, we're hitting this with a 175 watt laser. And then the actual printing process, we're going up to a 500 watt laser. So the actual morphology of the particles changes. And one of the reasons that graphene is actually the best one that we observe is, is because it shows the most stability at the higher laser powers. So it remains graphitic up to 175 watts, whereas the rest, actually copper sulfide, because at 773K, that's effectively its melting point, uh, starts to degrade. So we look at the Raman signature after each one of these experiments, and then the copper sulfide after you know, the 20 watts, um, just flat, you see nothing. And then the graphene actually remains graphitic, um, which is good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I hope I answered your questions. Jin, you have a, another question? Yes, I also have a question. I hope Automatic have your comment. So besides the quasi-static experiments, so you mentioned in your future work, you know, you also try some dynamic case, right? So for the large scale, like I know I can use the drop tower or Hopkinson bar, lots of those experimental techniques. So I'm just wondering, in a small scale, just like yours, quite a small, do you have some comment what experimental technique we can use or we should use? Yeah, so, you know, I've been talking with um, KLA about this. Um, so they, they have the ability to do fairly high strain rate, uh, just indentation. So after that, it's a matter of us controlling the geometry of the specimen, right? Um, so mm -hmm. we're looking at doing high strain rate pillar compression first to keep things simple. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we'll, We'll think a little bit more after that. And then, you know, just beyond high strain rate, we can also do fatigue, um, which is quite nice. And we can do fatigue at yeah. like very high frequencies. So that yes. that's that's not really two good directions to get into. Well, that's great. Yeah, many old people, they may have some bone issue when they're getting old. Like your experiments can be super helpful. Yeah, yeah. Osteoporosis is, is, is you know, I think something that hits, um, very personally for, uh, I think, most of the audiences when I give the stock. So um, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're hoping to, to move into some more, I think, clinically relevant experimental conditions and, and, and yeah. yeah. Nice job, Otman. Um, any more questions from the audience? Um, I can ask a question. Um, the fascinating job in the in the in the first part of the mirroring the bones in a, in a nanometer scale or uh, some micrometer scale. So I I was wondering when I listened to the talk, is what if we flip over the material like instead of the the ceramic hard material infused with those fibers, what if we flip over the materials, will we see similar behavior um, in smaller scales? Okay, so basically uh, changing the the relative stiffnesses of the reinforcing components, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I don't I don't think that'll be the case. We won't we won't see that at all, right? Um, so uh, I think one of the best papers to look at uh, for this is I think there's a paper by Robert McNicking in '86. I think it's like on um, reinforcement of ceramics. By by different uh, materials, 
And of course, when your reinforcement uh, fiber um, is, you know, brittle versus, uh, you know, ductile, your behavior is completely different, right? You can only store so much uh, strain energy before uh, the reinforcement breaks. Um, so you're gonna get totally different behavior. And I think in the other case, if you're going more ductile, so, uh, what's it called? Ductile matrix with stiff enforcement, um, most of your deformation is gonna come from the matrix. Yeah. I think I it's, a, it's not you. as great of a, of a fracture strategy, maybe in terms of just modifying, you know, um, it's post yield behavior, it's great, but definitely not as good as a fracture, fracture mitigation strategy. Yeah. I see, I see, yeah. thank you. Um, another question maybe is, uh, it's good, good for you to uh, advertise the, the recruitment a little bit. Uh, what exactly background of students or postdocs you are looking for? <laughs> yeah, um, so <laughs> that's a good question. Um, well, I, I think in this one, it's it's kind of limited to how I can recruit here. So here I can recruit students from mechanical engineering and material science specifically. Right now I'm looking for experimentalists um, who are interested in doing uh, small scale work. So people with fabrication experiments, uh, experience people with microscopy experience. Um, I think for the directions that we want to move into, uh, people who have worked with soft, um, soft materials, so soft matter, uh, students would be great. Yeah. Great. Ho hope like uh, and of course, classically me mechanicians, <laughs> of course, right? So yeah. Sounds good. Um, any questions from from the the rest of the audience? Um, if no, we can end today's um, webinar. And thank you again, Ockman, for for joining us and and give the wonderful talk. And uh, we'll see you all again uh, next month, uh, next Sunday. And uh, uh, Jin, do you want to introduce the uh, like broadcast a little bit? Uh, what will happen next Sunday? Uh, who, who is the who is the speaker? Oh, next Sunday we have the joint webinar by Hai Dong, Hai De here, and, and also Christos from Brown MIT, uh, Hai from Georgia Tech. That's great. Yeah. Um, Thank you and uh, we'll end today's webinar and uh, hope to see you all uh, next Sunday. Ultimately, your video will be seen by more people afterwards. We will upload it to WeChat and YouTube channel. Okay, great, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Nice talk, right. yeah. Yep. Bye. Have a good weekend, bye everyone. Yep. Bye.